Hello and welcome to the Ireland on the Fly podcast about the people and places of fly fishing in Ireland. It's time for another book club episode and this week we're joined by the prolific angling writer Chris McCulley. Chris has been a regular contributor to Trout and Salmon magazine and in his spare time he's written not just on fishing but also English academic works as well as poetry. In Ireland though he's probably best known for Nomads of the Tides fishing for Irish sea trout which he wrote with Ken Whelan back in 2013 and it's still a hugely respected and definitive book on sea trout fishing around Ireland. We've plenty to talk to Chris about for this book club episode, including his recent memoir, The River of All Goodbyes, and the one that got my interest, Names of the Fish in British and Irish Fresh Waters. But first, Tom, some great news for Care, I believe, at the World Cup. Yeah, man, Tara, yeah, yeah, great weekend, uh, the World Cup for uh, Care Anglers. So the World Cup, uh, the annual World Cup on Loch Mask was last weekend, the bank holiday weekend, and uh, it's, it's a great event. I mean, I often say it to you, you know, I like competitions, but one of the reasons I like competitions is for the social side of it. And it is a real social event. It's, you know, you get to meet up with a lot of good old, old friends, everything. You get drawn, people, you meet new boatmen, you meet new anglers drawn in the boat. It really is. It's a, a fantastic weekend. And like been on the go since 1952. Um, I often think it's probably worth us doing a, doing a show on it one of the times out in the future, uh, because, you know, there's a big history to it. Big history to it. And tell me this, is it the biggest competition in Ireland? Oh, it would be, yeah. And how many boats so, would you be talking about? Well, you're talking between roughly between four to 500 anglers enter it every year. Oh, and how yeah. do you qualify? Uh, so the process is there are four heat days. Yep, four heat days and then the final day, which traditionally used to be on the bank holiday Monday. But what they did is they moved it forward. Uh, and uh, so if there's a day lost to high winds, at least the bank called them under free. And that actually happened this year. No oh, way. Hey. Yeah, it did. Uh, what day was it? I think it was the, was it the Saturday. Um, no, it was the Sunday, the day the final was due to be on. Uh, uh, it was it was a rotten day, actually really bad. And um, so they put it back uh, to bank called them Monday. So uh, that's how they do it. And every heat day, you can only enter one heat day. And from each heat, 25% of the rods go through to the fountain. And then on the final, you start with the clean slate. And is you it know, like about 100 eight. anglers? Is there how many anglers on the day? Yeah, roughly like, uh, I, as I said last week there, I, I fished it on the, the Wednesday. No joy, no joy. Uh, but uh, I think the day I was out, there was 49 boats. So there was 98 anglers or something like that. So, it's so yeah. It's kind of like yeah, the focal so, point for the, the year. like for the Ah, it is, yeah. You know, a lot of people who even mo- wouldn't bother with uh, competition fishing would make, um, you know, they would still fish the World Cup because there is something about it. There's something special about it in the car park beforehand. And there's a great setup down in Cushlock for anybody who hasn't been there. And the Ballon of Anglers, a beautiful, um, great building, uh, car parking, great facilities down there. In lock style fishing, you could definitely say it is, you know, it is the, the it is the pinnacle of anybody who lock style fishes. But then of course, lock style fishing is generally, you know, um confined to, you know. Ireland, Scotland, uh, England, and Wales. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, like, to be honest, yeah, it's like, and we've done plenty on the Phipps Moosh ones. I mean, that includes different types of angling. But, yeah, you could say for lock style fishing, this will be this will be the pinnacle. Yeah, definitely. Be, yeah. I think I'd like to do an episode on that, looking into the history on it. Oh, the history. I mean, Dennis Kelleher, who's, the, who's heavily involved with us, uh, Clare man, but living in Ballon for years, uh, wrote a book on it about 15 years ago. Um, uh, it's still a great read to this day. Um, really is. It just goes back through the whole history of it and everything. At one stage, there was a car as first prize. Well, yeah. they were the days. Yeah. Yeah. And um, no, it was really, really good. But um, no, it's a great event. But uh, as I said, um, up the premier county, I was going to say, God, I was nearly, geez, I'm nearly going to say up the banner. My God. <laughs> geez. Up, up the premier county. Yeah. So John Quirk from Care won it uh, Mind, John. on the final day. Yeah. He'd. Um, two good fish um i think they were close on four pounds and second was john pertel who another care angler and john john had three fish um but uh was pipped by uh, a few ounces by by um by john quirk third place with mark rogan who's based in waterford and then fourth place was connor O'Mahony, and connor's connor's son kyle was on the irish youth team uh so he's fr- he was just back he was just back from the, the four in a row victory over in Grafham because uh, he'd gone over with Kyle and Kyle, Kyle, fair play to him. Kyle did very well as well on the, on the, 
So what, what it's a bit of a there. golden age for Irish sport, you know. We're twelfth in the Olympic medals table. Yeah. Um, I yeah. think I saw a stat there at one stage. Was it we were fourth in the swimming um, medals table in the world for the Olympics? Wow. Don't quote me on I that. I might that. need to double check it. Now. Yeah. It might be fifth or sixth or seventh or something. Yeah. But anyway, it's top mad stats. Mad stats. <laughs> but um, yeah. yeah, so there you go. And then the, now the the youth anglers, the four in the row. So Jesus. yeah. Golden times. Oh, no, that that was phenomenal. It really was. As uh, when you look back at it, and like to be twelfth in the medal table, even more. But they might bring fishing back to the Olympics. I remember did, that. Did you see that? It. There was a great article. Um, it was. Just I did see that. Yeah, nineteen hundred. Mm. In 1900, it was mm. the one and only time fishing. I think it was in France, I think, as well. At the in time. France. And it was on the Seine. There's a picture of yeah. all the guys on the Seine. And they yeah. were fishing. Uh, it was the one and only time it was um, part of the Olympics. There has been various moves down through the ages. Well, not down through the down through the last century. There has been various like mootings of getting it in. But Well, I don't know. If they can know. put skateboarding and yeah. <laughs> other yeah. questionable <laughs> sports. In hey, don't knock it. You know, this, there might be a couple of skateboarders that are ardent listeners to this show. Although, I don't know. <laughs> not sure. that, that Venn diagram, that subset would <laughs> be very small. <laughs> very, very small. Um, yeah, there's some crazy ones in it. I just go back there in fifth place then was well known anger from uh down in uh Cantark was Michael Tuig. Uh so yeah, look, it was good. It fished hard on the final day, fished very hard. Uh I was talking and you quite a few lads out in it and it was tough. So but fair play fair play to um lads of fair play to fair play to the Premier County. It's a, it's one to win. It's a it's a blue ribbon one. Well done, that's well done. Is. You know, it really is. Right. So look, when we get back to this week's episode then anyway, Chris McCulley, another book club episode. And I first asked Chris if it was true that his most recent book, The River of All Goodbyes, really was the last one he was ever going to write. I've no no plans to write any further at book length. And uh, nobody believes me and when I when I say this. My wife doesn't believe me. She says, Of course you you know, you've been writing for forty years or fifty years. Um and my colleagues back in Essex when I was still at work, I mean, none of them believe, believe me. And this is not a matter of, you know, passing a hand over the fevered brow and saying, you know, darlings, I'm been expecting everybody to say, oh, but really you must carry on. It's nothing to do with that. I've been writing for an awful long time in several different fields, actually. Um, and when you think, I published my first poem in 1973, and my first angling feature in 1981. And, you know, that's an awfully long run. And you just get, you just get tired and you find yourself beginning, at least I found myself beginning to be not exactly repetitive, but I knew roughly what worked and, and how I could construct a feature and how I could construct a book chapter and how I could finish out a poem or translate a, a bit of old English. Um, and so after all of that time, you know, you've got to be wise enough to say, well, you know, enough is enough. Do you not just, does it not, do you not have the urge or the joy <laughs> from it? Like? No, I have to say I don't. That, that's the strictly honest truth. I mean, I have a very, a very rich life here. I have a big garden. I've got a dog, with a Labrador, who's, who I'm training up to, to work. She's a good dog. I think, I think we'll probably get another one. What There's the all the fishing you? still to do. I've got a library course, and uh, you know a fairly rich and, and and good life. And you know I can't I can't really say that I found a tremendous readership. You know why do people write in the first place? I mean partly it's so we can all have a conversation. When I was younger, my way of having conversations was by writing, publishing. Your way of having a conversation is to do this now. You know, the, the, media, the media have changed mm. through which we can have these kind of cons, uh, conversations about the things that really fascinate us or, or preoccupy us. When I was thinking about, um, sorry, I'm probably giving you a longer answer than no, you expected or wanted, but I think, you know, it's, it's an interesting question. When I was thinking about it and the relative lack of, of finding a readership which would sustain the sort of conversations that I was interested in, I just thought, okay, well, you know, I'm pushing, I'm in my mid-60s, I'm retiring. Who really is interested in another feature article from Chris McCulley or another book? 
you know, I've said pretty much what I wanted to say. Time to stop. Okay. Wow. All right. Uh, I just noticed there, Chris, um, you know, because I could see it from Dara, you know, when he asked you, do you not get the joy? And you said, no. But did you ever, when you initially wrote? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The energy, the ambition, the ego that I had to begin with. I mean, you couldn't, <laughs> you couldn't live with it. <laughs> It was terrible. It was absolutely <laughs> dreadful. You know, I, I think I, I sometimes, very occasionally, I look back at some of the pieces I was doing, uh, particularly after I left Manchester in the early 2000s. And then Monica and I had moved to the Netherlands and um, I'd given up, as I thought, full-time academic life. And I was really trying my damnedest to make a living as much as possible from my pen. And the energy that change brought with it. Um, I mean, Philip Larkin, the poet, has a wonderful phrase about, I hope I'm quoting him right, but all the energy that being changed can give. And he was talking about falling in love. And we all know that energy when you've, you've, you've fallen in love and you, you feel yourself almost physically changing. And it gives you this huge rush of energy. And I sometimes look at those pieces that, that I was writing in the early 2000s. Not very often. Um, and some of them are quite funny and, and they're relatively, they're, they're as well constructed as I could make them. Um, some, some of them are pike fishing and, oh, yeah, it was, yeah, then I, then I had energy yeah. and ambition, I have to say. But the ambition was also aligned with a certain kind of desperation because I was broke and I needed to make, <laughs> make sure that the writing paid. Um, I'm just interested, actually, Chris, you said your first feature article was 1981. What was it mm. on? Do you know? Yeah. Yeah, to my shame. Um, it was about fishing fishing buzzer pupae at Coldingham Loch in the Scottish Borders. I was a, I was a, a student. And I was working with one of my tutors who was interested in... in learning about fly fishing. And of course, I thought I owned the earth in those days and I knew everything about everything. So I designed some buzzer pupae made of strips of nappy liner because the nappy liner absorbed water very quickly and also would take a Pantone pen so you could color it. It was cheap, they were quick to make. And I weighted these pupae so that they fished vertically in the water like a, a natural pupa swaying upwards. And I was really thrilled with this. And they caught a few fish, you know, and because, <laughs> because I didn't know any better. I, I thought, yeah, it'd be lovely to write an article for the magazine. So I, I submitted a piece to Trout Fisherman, which was edited by John Wilshaw in those days. And he accepted it. And I even got a fee for this. And so little have I succeeded in life that I would gladly accept the same fee for an article these days. <laughs> Those are the good old days when they paid you for the articles. Good old, <laughs> good old days. Might I just throw in there, Chris, that I feel that there might be a few listeners of Ireland on the Fly going out buying Pampers this week. <laughs> oh, good for them. <laughs> if you cut if you cut the Pampers into strips about, um, I mean, you ignore the, the lining. Don't, don't mess with the lining if you know what's good for you. But the, the actual, the, the, the slightly harder bit, the surface of the of the nappy um, strips about an eighth of, an eighth of an inch wide, cheap, quick. That's the sort of story of my life, really. Cheap, <laughs> cheap <laughs> quick, and easy to make. Got to try it. <laughs> <laughs> Ahead of your time, uh, Chris, in the nineteen eighties, one must say. Um, not really, not really. <laughs> the, the most difficult bit of that whole performance was. Um, the magazine asked for a publicity photograph. Of course, I was 20. I mean, I didn't know what a publicity photograph was. So I got a, the girlfriend of the time to take a photograph by Lise's Lake with an old um, Instamatic camera. And uh, it'll be there somewhere in the Trout Fisherman's archives. Really? In someone has built. Chris, you don't mind me asking. <laughs> Sorry, we're really sad. I'm dwelling on this lot. How did you find out about this? I improvised. <laughs> Like, I've no what? idea. I, I've no <laughs> idea. I'll tell you, there's um, another little trick that I have. I should be I should be charging you more for these um, you know, fly dressing secrets. But you use the word more there. <laughs> f 
for years, I tried to find the right color for a fly that both of you will know. It's a Donegal blue. It was one of S Sydney Spencer's favorite flies for sea trout for the west of Ireland, particularly the Esk system. Yeah. And I was very unhappy. I mean, most of us, you know, we order seals for a substitute and it comes in a little package and it's a sort of rather violent aquamarine blue. And that was no good to me. And, and turquoise is no good. And a really fell blue color, that was no good. So I, I got some of the turquoise and I mixed up the seals fur and I softened it with a little bit of fluff that I got from the screen of the tumble dryer. <laughs> now, it is a, a secret only known to anglers that whatever color of the initiating stuff you put into a tumble dryer on the screen at the end of the cycle, it's always blue. <laughs> You could put in the yellow, a whole set of yellow 90s, and what would come off the screen would be blue. Like, only God knows how this works. Do you know? But anyway, I got some of this stuff from the screen yeah. of the tumble dryer, yeah, and I that's... softened the packet of seals first up for the Donegal blue, and I still make the fly with that. So when I say that I'm cheap and I'm quick, <laughs> I, really, I really do mean it. Yeah, you're, you're backing it up, all right, Chris. There you go, evidence. It's an old academic habit. Chris, this is your next book. Yes. Fly well, Tying Secrets of Chris McCulley. Okay. Well, I thought you were going to, for one awful moment, I thought you were going to call it, you know, what I found on the screen of the top of the drive. <laughs> it sounds like a kind of postmodern masterpiece, really. Or something from Monty Python. <laughs> Yeah, okay. Very good. I'm sorry to lead us astray so quickly in this talk. Jesus, it's I, I tell you, this is what I like about these episodes. They go anywhere. Just so people know, and, and I'm going to give the, um, the listeners a, the chronological list of your angling books. This doesn't include the anthologies, I might add. 1992, Fly Fishing, A Book of Words. 1998, The Other Side of the Stream. 2006, Editor, Passion for Pike. 2008, Sketches with Fishing Rods. Uh, 2009, Fishing and Pike Lures, 2011, Outside, 2013, which I'm going to come to now in a second, Nomads of the Tides, Fishing for Irish Sea Trout, 2019, Star Diaries, 2022, Names of the Fish in British and Irish Freshwaters, which we'll also touch on in a minute, and then 2023, The River of All the Goodbyes. I tell you, it's quite a list to have. Um, just before I ask you about the Nomads of the Tides, which our Irish listeners would obviously be very aware of, what was your particular favourite out of all of those, Chris? The book I was writing at the time. <laughs> Good answer. I think any any writer, <laughs> yeah. would, any writer would probably tell you the same if they were being honest. Yeah. I have to say that the the, the very last book, the book about the wharf, mm. it came from some sort of place, not exactly of of great nostalgia, but a place both of return and new beginning, because the wharf has run through my life you know, like a, like a braid. Um, I fished it when I was a boy and I fish it still, you know, and, and, um, and, and to, to, to do my best to represent that river and its history and its angling history and its culture and some of the faces and voices who have fished it was a great privilege. And I still go back once a week, you know, I'll be, I'll be there on Monday next week fishing. So um, that, that book really came from a very special place and I, I knew it was going to be my last book yeah. so I gave it my, my Sunday best sort of lick there was even a little touch of the Sam Beckett there's a whole paragraph which is un, unpunctuated and I learned that technique from Sam Beckett's <laughs> late work <laughs> I want to ask you about Nomads of the Tides Irish fly anglers would be very aware of it I'm sure what led you to write it was it that sea trout or your are the fish for you um, when it comes to fly angling? Was it because of your visits to Ireland? Just give us a bit of the kind of context and background to it. It was partly the visits to Ireland, but when when I made the first of the visits that went into the making of Nomads, it was 2007. And actually, I hadn't gone back to Ireland to fish for sea trout for nearly 10 years. I'd, I'd, I'd gone over to fish for pike in Loch Durg and one or two locks in Leitrim, in the float tube. But I had no plans to go back to Connemara and fish for sea trout. And, you know, my life would take me in a very different direction. Uh, but then a phone call came from Trout and Salmon, 
And um, I was in Amsterdam minding my own business. And um, Sandy Leventon, who was then um, either editing or, or just about to finish editing his stint on um, Trout and Salmon, said, look, um, would, would I like to go back to Connemara to fish for sea trout? And my immediate reply in 2007 was, there are no sea trout left in Connemara because of the sea lice and the killery cages in um, yeah, the salmon farming. And he said, you're wrong, you know. He said, in the killery harbour, there's an experiment underway where people are farming cod and some sea trout have reappeared in the bell in the hinge. So would you like to go over? And he said, uh, you know, you can stay about in the hinge. We, we've sort of worked out a rough itinerary for you. And I went over and had a great week, actually. I was working with a photographer um, by the name of Rod Calbraid, who's since become a great friend. And we had a good week together. And we caught some smallish sea trout. Um, I think we fished the Erif as well. And we were working with Mark Corr, who then was uh, working for the Irish Tourist Board as a kind of angling advisor. And he was a very expert salmon fisherman. So his um, salmon expertise did save us on a number of uh, occasions. On the Cashler, he got a salmon, and I think he got another one on the Erif in the last 20 minutes of the whole week-long visit. So we made three features out of the, the week. And I was pleased with them. And I, you know, nostalgically, I was very pleased to be back. And I was delighted with the, the possibilities that seemed to be opening themselves for following the, the salmon farms and experimenting with cod and you know all of that. It, it was an interesting background. Uh, I thought no more of it, but someone must have thought we'd, we'd done a, a good job because I was invited back the following year in 2008 and then I fished in Mayo with uh, Judd Ruin and the, the experience I had fishing with Judd Ruin on the Moy on, on the estuary was fascinating it was absolutely fascinating and it, it, it started to make me think I thought well you've got sea trout in the estuaries you've got sea trout in the lochs you've got sea trout in the rivers um you know, maybe I thought to myself in 2008, maybe there's something in this if I kept coming back. And that summer, I mentioned to John Ward Allen, who was a publisher of Medler, who, who brought out some of my books. I said, look, John, you know, what do you think about this idea of doing a slightly fuller length work on Irish sea trout and their history? Uh, I said, it's probably going to be too big, big for me. Um, and I've never fished on the East Coast or, or in, in, in the North, but what do you think? And it, it was a hot day at the game fair, and I think John just wanted me to go away, and he said, yes, just like that. He said, yeah, sure. And I took him at his word. <laughs> and so from 2009 through to the conclusion of the project in 2012, um, I was visiting multiple times a year, usually four or five times a year, um, making feature articles, but also collecting materials for the book and interviewing people and talking to anybody that that I thought was you know had a great story to tell, and there were plenty of them, and some very very expert kind voices. So that's how the book really came to be made. But it, it took a bit of doing because you know I, I didn't have a, a great sponsor. I mean, once a year, the, I think the Irish Tourist Board of Fulcher Island would. Uh, subsidise one of the trips uh, but the rest I paid for out of my own pocket so I did quite a lot of extra work in the winters as a freelance teacher to pay for the fishing of the following year um, so yeah but I, I enjoyed doing it and I enjoyed setting it up and I enjoyed working with Ken Whelan who I, I asked to, to work alongside me at a very early stage and then James Sadler who became a great friend a very expert graphic designer and photographer. He, he worked with me as well. And then there was Gardner Mitchell, photographer who um, worked with me on so many of the trout and salmon features. Marcus Muller, Mark Corr, you know, all of these people, they became a kind of team. And we worked, you know, really well together. 
And you learn, you know, you learn an awful lot about someone when you're making a feature article under pressure and you're in a boat for a whole of an angling day and the fishing is tough. You learn a lot about people under those circumstances. Tell me about and I was that. never, ever disappointed <laughs> in what I found. You must have though, Chris, at some or one stage or many stages when you're in the thick of it going, what have I started? Because the amount of work, the amount of information that's in that book is just phenomenal. It, it escaped. I mean, one of my fatal habits as a writer was always to try too hard. And for 20 or 30 years, I would overwrite everything. And it used to show up particularly keenly, this bad habit at the end of a feature article where I'd always want to dot the I's and cross the T's. So my, my final paragraph, Sandy Leventon, who was a, a, a wonderful journalist, very hard bitten, very old school. He used to edit my final paragraphs with a, a, a terrible pen. He, he would excise <laughs> some of my Sunday best <laughs> prose he really would. I, I got really cross with him because, you know, this was my huge effort. It was all overwritten. He was quite right. I was trying too hard. And, and Nomads has all the hallmarks of a, a middle-aged man trying too hard all over it. So it escaped into a website. It escaped into a blog at the time where I was parking all this extra material that wasn't going to make it into as it were, the final book. But that's interesting, though, Chris, because, like... Uh, you're an academic you've written plenty of academic books as well and and yeah. um, pieces and articles which you know you would think acad- academia it lends itself to maybe tighter more sparse yeah. style of writing so was kind of the fishing yeah. writing then your chance to just let go and just you know have at it like- there might have been there might have been something in that i mean if i look at my academic prose it's a model of of sparseness and, mm. and clarity and over the years, the, the poems too, you know, just became shorter and shorter until they became mercifully silent. You know, <laughs> um, two lines was about all I could manage on a good day in the end. But um, f- for some reason, this 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 habit of trying too hard never left me. And I think it's connected with a kind of underlying nervousness or a desire to impress, which has never quite never quite left me. It's one of those books I always think, um, you know, it's it, as an Irish fly angler or as somebody who's into sea trip, it's one of those books you want to have on your shelf. It's really kind of you to say that. You know, one of my hopes for that was we've lost so much, I mean, in terms of the runs of sea trout, not just in, in Ireland and parts of the west of Ireland, but also in parts of the west of Scotland as well. And I think that, Maybe some in, in another 10 years, you know, it will be 20 years from when No Man's finished, but in another 10 or 20 years, someone will look back and say, well, that's a baseline of how it was mm. yeah. all those years ago. You know, sea trout did run into these places. They were found in this river. They were found in this loch system. And I think that's really important because even as we're having this conversation now, you know, there are locks in the West in parts of Connemara that nobody will have fished for years and all the old drifts will have been completely forgotten. Mm. Very true. Very true. Did Very you true. did you fish it, um, Chris, in the earlier days, like before the fish farms came in and before the runs disappeared completely? Like had you yeah, do you have good a memories bit, of um a little bit. I I was um I I had a school friend whose family had a, a house out in the West and so um I, I visited there as a, a slightly bewildered, a slightly overwhelmed schoolboy. And so, yeah, that was the 1970s. So I do remember some of the uh, some of the days. But, if, of course, you know, back then we thought it was all going to last forever. And I, 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 I'm horrified at how blasé we all were. But the same happened in our, in, in Ireland, in Scotland. You know, I started to fish the west coast of Scotland very early on in the, in the late 1970s, 1980s, when I was a student, and fish Loch Shield for sea trout. Even managed to fish Loch Marie before that crashed, hmm. and had some wonderful fishing up there. And again, we thought it was going to last forever. And it, it's a, a, one of the saddest things that, that all of this, this great fishing and almost a way of life, disappeared. Yeah, very true. 
we actually did a we did a podcast on Loch Marie, yeah. actually. Did you? Uh, with, yeah, with one of the gillies up there, own McLean, and uh, yeah, it was yeah, it's sad the whole thing. Great that you actually got to fish it before the crash. Yeah, I mean, I didn't do desperately well um, on Loch Marie, I have to say, but I caught my first salmon on Loch Shiel in 1982 on my own in the boat. And it, absolutely remarkable. I mean, the, the loch was was rising and all the friends I'd gone to fish with had thought, you know, the hell with this. And they'd gone to fish for mackerel on the coast. And I thought, well, I'm not going to, I didn't come all this way to fish for mackerel. So stubbornly, I took the boat out on my own and a salmon, it was a beautiful grill, actually, it had been in the sea that morning, bright blue, took a blue Zulu. And um, I felt like Hugh Falkus, you know, I felt like a god when I landed that fish. It was all around the boat and it was very well mannered, actually, in, in retrospect, it was just round and round the boat. And we were kind of exchanging compliments for five minutes until eventually it tumbled into a carp net which i pressed into service i didn't have a salmon net um but yeah i mean again i it's years since i've been back to the west of scotland to fish um it, it almost breaks my heart i mean that said that said i've not i've not lost my love of sea trout fishing and i was up on the in caith ness a month ago with some friends fishing for salmon on the river hallowdale and i found that there were still some sea trout in the estuary of the hallowdale and I was very taken with the Hallidale estuary. And then I found out that there might be some sea trout fishing in the Helmsdale estuary and on the Brora in the salt water. So I'm going back in a month's time to fish up there again. So I've never quite lost my love of the sea trout and the estuaries and these wild places. Uh, Chris, when was the last time you were in Ireland fishing? Um, are, have your days come over? Are they kind of gone, come to an end now? Or, or, where are you at? I think so. I, I think the last trip, I was racking my brains before um, before we had this chat, and I think it was 2018 or 2019. We, we did have a I, – I went up to Donegal with um, Gardner Mitchell, and we did uh, some brown trout work on New Lake, which I thought was lovely. I thought it was really bonny very clear water and there were one or two other locks. So yeah, we made some features in 2018. And I think in 2019, I didn't come across. In 2020, we were planning to come across and do something on the Corrib, which I've never fished incidentally. Um, no, somebody, no, somebody could take you out. <laughs> but then COVID and a big heart attack intervened. Uh. And that put me out, the, the heart attack put me out of action for a while. And uh, so, yeah, and then we, we had plans last year to go down to Wexford and, and do some work on the shore and then spell it with some bass fishing on the fly. But that we couldn't get our diaries to work. So I'm not saying, you know, no, it's all it's all over. But the, the opportunities and diaries are, are difficult to come by. Um, but you do know, obviously, fishing in Ireland um, very well through, obviously, your visits and your book there. And I did want to so touch... I have a superficial knowledge. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, I tell you, I do want to touch, though, on your book in 2022, Names of the Fish in British and Irish Freshwaters. Now, Tom is licking his lips at this because there's many rabbit holes he's prepared to go down here um, <laughs> when we're talking about the... Uh, <laughs> the origins of words uh first off tell us what led you to such a book and give us maybe some of the kind of maybe the more interesting ones maybe relating to ireland if you could as well well years years ago when i was still a very young academic i'd done a dictionary of fly fishing it was called fly fishing a book of words and then oxford university press picked up the paperback rights of that and slapped uh, a, a rather garish but rather lovely cover on it with some quotes from the early reviews. And, and the book did very, very well in paperback. And sorry, that sounds immodest, but by, by my <laughs> modest standards, it had done pretty well in paperback. And, and I'd never lost my interest in lexicography, um, word origins. And it's partly, you know, that was part of my field as an academic, reconstructing the history of Germanic languages, English in particular, but um, so when I was coming to the end of my academic life in Essex, I thought, well, wouldn't it be interesting to 
try and revisit some fish names. And I was doing quite a lot of course fishing at the time in the River Stour in Essex, Essex Suffolk border. Occasionally I catch some roach and perch and then I started to think, well, what is a roach called a roach? What is etymology? And, and all of these questions started to um, yeah, beg answers, really. And I, I knew the territory. I knew where the, the research materials were. I did have access to the Oxford English Dictionary. I, I knew some of the, the strokes I could pull, as it were, to, to find out. And slowly I started to construct word lists. And it was actually very difficult to know what to include and what to leave out. And I wrote an, an overlong essay at the beginning of the book saying, these were my principles of inclusion and exclusion. Um, but I enjoyed writing it. The, the, the difficulties really came with the Irish terms, some of the Scottish terms and the Welsh terms. But my, my fav some of my favourites, I mean, everybody knows about Gilleru, the, the red, the red boy, the red fellow. Um, but then there was the etymology of the word, and I'm going to mispronounce this, Tom, I'm terribly sorry, Sonahan. <laughs> Pronounce it properly? Sonahan. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I'm not even going to attempt well, it, no, but actually, every, To be honest, but, everybody calls him Sonahan. But it's interesting, when you talk to Jackie Mahan, who's up beside it, he calls him Sonahan. Sonahan, okay. But you talk to any anybody the rest around the country, they'll talk about Sonahan. Well, that, that beat me. I mean, the, the, the Oxford English Dictionary has no record of it. As, and actually, some of these terms, they, it astonished me that the terms that you and I would use quite uh, freely, the dictionary had no um, record of them, and I couldn't find very much to help elsewhere. So I asked one or two, I asked Ken, and he put me on to Lillis and Lindsay Clark, also as, a, as an expatriate Englishman, asked around in Donegal, where he's based. And they came up with this etymology in Irish, which was, uh, uh, I forget, it was Sona and Achon, um, which was translated as the happy little, the happy fellow, the happy little fellow. And I thought that was great. Uh, now, whether that's true or not, or whether it's just a piece of kind of etymological embroidery, I don't know. But um, Melvin fascinated me, I have to say, when I fished it. I mean, I thought, you know, Gillaroo was a kind of angling fiction. It's not. I mean, Lindsay said, look, feel that the, the belly of that fish, and it was crunching with snails. And the Sonahan in these little uh, open water shoals, two rods bent, uh, over 80 feet of water and these massive pectorals which the fish have evolved to to climb the currents where, of the streams where they're going to spawn. It, it absolutely fascinated me. I thought it was a fascinating lake. Um, so so those little bits of etymology, fictional or not, aligned with the beauty of the lake and the generosity of the people that I was fishing with when I did eventually visit Melbourne. It just conspired to be you know, a really happy set of memories, both intellectual and practical. Like just such a great idea for a book in terms of, you know, mm. it's one of those that, you know, you just pick up and you, you just go through it. I enjoy doing it. Actually. Yeah. Like, because that obviously Sorry ties it. across you, but no, I, mean, but I enjoy it. Doing. Does it cross over then with your kind of academic uh, work in terms of yeah. the research? Yeah. So it was, you got the best of both worlds, Chris, with it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think. Some of my academic colleagues thought I'd gone entirely mad, you know, it was just sort of Chris banging on about fish again, but Chris banged on about quite a lot in life. So fish was just, you know, yet another one of his preoccupations. But I think so often things, histories and cultural histories are embedded in the words that we use. And so, you know, if you reflect on even a word like Finnock, for a, a juvenile sea trout. Fion Ach, the white one, the little white one, people have been obsessed by the whiteness. You know, all of us have caught these little fish, these beautiful, clean scaled, white, hurling, finnock, uh, whittling, you know, juvenile sea trout. And that fascination is actually encoded in the in the etymology of the of the term. Mm. So that, that interests me a great deal. At the moment, I'm doing a little bit of work on the wildflowers that I'm finding in Upper Wharfdale when I'm fishing. 
Um, again, the, the way in which people have seen the, the wildflowers and sometimes have used them medicinally or have have conceived them culturally, they're embedded in the in the, the names of the words. So I was photographing last week a plant, a wild plant called Lady's Bed Straw, and it's very common. It, it occurs it'll occur, occur in Ireland as well. And I thought, well, why, is, why on earth are you called Lady's Bed Straw? Yeah, and it has a yellow, a small yellow flower, and it and the bracken were apparently there at the time of Christ's birth. And the bracken in the crib refused to recognize Christ. And so it was doomed to become brown and never flower beautifully. But Lady's Bed Straw recognized the coming, the nativity of the Christ. And it was made to, to have this beautiful yellow flower in the summer. Amazing. So Lady's Bed Straw. This is what I mean by, you know, whole cultural histories are sometimes encoded into etymologies. Yeah, I, I find the whole thing, I, I'm actually very interested in as well in it, uh, Chris. And it's interesting there with your one on uh, Sanahan. Now, as I said, I've I seen it before, and I have another version of Sanahan, was Saunahan, and that was coming from the month, Samhain is the month of November in Irish, and that it was a fish that spawned in November. Now, but here's the thing with etymology and going back, I mean, my own name is Sullivan, right? And the Gaelic of it is Sulwan, and I've always taken it to be one eye, which is the Gaelic for that. But there's other people that say it's Sul Duan, which is a black eyed person. So a black eyed you know, person. Yeah, Sul Du, Sul Duan. All right. So what was the correct one? You know, we'll never know. You we'll know never know. Just, no, we won't, you see. And it's Would you like, like you know, if if this book ever hits a second edition, I think I'm pretty safe in thinking it never will. But if it ever comes in a second edition, do you want to help me work through the Irish term? Well, yeah, well, I'd love to. I'd it's love a lifetime's to. work, I'd say. Yeah, yeah, I'd love to. Like, it's very interesting that we have. I'm from an area here called Joyce Country. Do you show you? Which is north of Connemara, and our Irish is different to Connemara Irish. Uh, kind of closer to Mayo Irish, uh, but it's you know I've, I'm nothing it, sagely it, here. Well, you can't. But anyway, it's a it's a different. You know, we can I can understand people from other areas of the country, no problem. But we have our own phrases, etc. And interestingly, in Joy's country, and do you show you? Uh, we have a, a distinct name for trout, which isn't in any other Irish speaking area, and we call it an umon. And if Can you spell that on up and yeah, I O M A for the N, I think. And it's it's only used here. You'd actually hear a lad saying it to you, uh, you know, a water to win them on. Like, did you get any actually literally, did you kill any trout? <laughs> you know? I'm talking to Kevin Kerrigan, who's in the Orkneys with me, where he grew up, and Kevin is fluent Irish speaker, and they had three words for the three phases of trout growing up. They had for a very small trout. In the river, like what we call fry almost, they call it a blowhorn. Yeah. Now, the translation of a blowhorn, as far as I can see, is a little flower. Mm. Right? How and lovely. Blowhorn. And then the intermediate one, where it gets to a certain size and it goes to the lake, they call it a salahon. And then when it was in the lake and it was big, it was an umon. And that was their name. They, they had a name for the three stages of the trout. Blowhorn, salahon, and umon. Corresponding roughly with par... And I don't know what the sort of intermediate stage would be, but I mean, certainly yeah. the seed tray, yeah. you've got the par, you've got the par, you've got the smolt, you've got smolt, you know, adult, the yeah. finnock, and then you've got the adult fish. So how interesting. I love yeah. the little flower. <laughs> yeah, it is actually. No, I, I must ask Kevin again, is would he ever think about that? But that, you know, to me, I've always assumed that one. And you'd hear people saying it there, you know, you know, it would be, um, a, dis, uh, a disparaging term when somebody said they got a fish, you go, ah, it's only a blowhorn. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it, it's fascinating because there, there are lots of words in English for diminutive forms of fish. One of my favourite is the word shot. And I was fishing for grayling with a, a Yorkshire friend of mine and about 10 years ago, I said, have you caught anything? And he said, oh, I just have a couple of shots. And I said, what the hell are you talking about, shots? 
He said, you know, he said, as if I know everything, um, you know. And I said, no, I don't know. That's why I'm asking. And he said, shots, little grayling. Sure. Now, I've put this in the, in the, in the book here. Um, but I think the shot is a term for a diminutive grayling, which goes a long, long way back to Old English. And it goes back to Old English shout. And that word was also applied to small trout, plural shelton. And a, sh a shout was a fish that darted, which shot about, literally shot, scooted about under, underwater. Um, wow. So it, it's only an accident that we call trout, trout in English or Irish English. Mm. It, we could easily have called them shot or shot and for Yeah. We easily That's could have done if the French hadn't, you know, come and invaded us. <laughs> Actually, speaking about that, do you remember that in Wheeler's Anthology? God, um, you know Wheeler's Anthology? The, um, no. Uh, I'm showing my ignorance. It, it's, um, God, the circle. it's up there somewhere. But anyway, it's a piece from the 1800s and a travelling, it's some town in the north of England, right? And a travelling justice is going into court, right? And he sees a guy fishing in the river outside, right? And he says, what are you fishing for? And the guy went, Almax, right? And he says, oh, he says, I'd like some of them. Have some for me when my court session is finished. And he was looking forward to having some Almax. But when he got in, the, the meal was prepared for him and it was gudgeon, perch and roach. And apparently, what whatever the local dialect was, Almax meant everything. <laughs> <laughs> He'll have had a lovely supper with his mouth full of roach. <laughs> <laughs> have you ever eaten them? They're horrible. Have you actually? Like eaten cotton wool stuffed with pins. I wouldn't. I really wouldn't first. recommend it. Take your word for it. <laughs> I think I, I um I was just reading that for your the book there as well, uh, Chris. Seventy different words for sea trout. Is that right? Seventy. Oh yeah including all the juvenile forms and all the dialectal terms and, you know, Welsh suing, Finnock, Whittling, Hurling, you name it. And now uh, Life of the Sea Trout records, I mean, he, he just records every name he ever came across in all of his travels. I mean, he's a formidable scientist. It's a wonderful book about the sea trout, as I'm sure you know. But he records an awful lot of those terms. I can't oh, call all of them really, to mind, yeah. but there are an yeah. awful lot of them. What are the strangest ones? What are the ones that jump out at you? Uh, things like burn tail. Burn tail. That was that was one which I and I couldn't I couldn't trace the etymology of that unless it was the trailing edge of a sea trout's caudal tail fin, which looks yeah. vaguely sort of burnt in the water. It shows up. I think my my favourite term altogether was clown or clown which is wow. only found in County Wicklow. And in Wicklow, everybody referred to the clowns. And I said, well, you know, what, what a, a clown. And I was absolutely stumped by this. Yeah. But then, coincidentally, I was lucky enough to interview, or at least to sit in an, on a conversation with Eamon de Butler, who oh, was wow. having a, a chat with Ken. And I put this, I said to Eamon, look, you, you know, you're a native speaker of Irish. What about clown? And unhesitatingly, he said, um, this word is always pronounced disyllabic, clown. And he said, yeah. that's, a, that's a, a key to, a clue to its etymology, which is Kalia Owen. Maiden, uh, maiden river. Of the, the river. Maiden of the river. Um. So that absolutely blew my mind. And so I hope that that etymology, which I've duly recorded, will eventually find its way into the Oxford English Dictionary because I think that deserves to, to be more widely known. Another one that really um, got to me was the word slanger, which I've only ever heard in Wexford. And it was, slanger was a, a term for a, a sea trout kelt. Slanger. Um, sea trout celts are very, very thin. Yeah. And I wondered yeah. if the word slanger was related to the word, word slang, which means snake in Dutch. 
So right. something really, really small. But how, how a, a Germanic word would get to Wexford and be used in those contexts, I have no idea. Wow. Blackberry trout, slat, you you slat. you you yeah. name it. The sea yeah, trout. we use interestingly here on the car, we use slat for kelt. Yeah, we don't Do use you? kelt at all, actually. We use slat. Do you use slat? Yeah, slat, yeah. slat salmon, or or the trout after spawning. I was a slat trout, he's very slatty. But yeah. we, use slat, well, we don't use kelt at all. Under so my, my mat under my mattress. Yeah. My mattress on in, in the bed rests on thin pieces of wood, which we call slats. Ah. So just a, a thin right. piece of wood there, you know. So it's just so that so there you go. See, I found it on the Argadine River. Lovely little stream that in County yeah. Cork. Yeah. It is actually a lovely little stream. Oh, magnificent. Yeah. I, I really enjoyed that it was a little silver stream and um and the night fishing funny, was very you good. Mentioned, you mentioned blackberry trout there. And yeah. we had um oh um, the own Moor fishery down in Kerry. We had Frank Monson on about it, and he talks about the run of blackberry trout, he says, but they haven't come in the last few years. And I, I'd actually meant to ask him when we were doing the podcast about it, because it immediately it stuck in my head hearing oh, blackberry trout, but I never got a chance to ask him again. So where have you found blackberry trout? Cork. Cork. Mm. That was the Argadine again, I think. Right. Yeah. Is that to do with is that to do with timing of the season that they came with the blackberries? So. I yeah. think it must be. Yeah. Late that must be a late run, you know, a September run of fish. I've come across this term only once. Chris McCulley writes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Argadine, yeah, County Cork, Southwest Ireland. And it's nice. in a pamphlet. Uh, school sea trout are often called blackberry trout. Later July and August when the blackberries are ripening. So, yeah, but it wouldn't be, it's not, I mean, Cork isn't a mil million miles away from the Kerry Island Moor, so it, it wouldn't surprise yeah. me at all. I've never heard it on, on uh, down in uh, Waterville, though. I've not heard I've not heard that term down there, and you'd expect it to be used down there. Yeah, yeah, you would. But yeah. I've never heard it down there. It was quite localised. But... The amount Did... of work you had to do to to delve into all of these names, Chris. It like... was, yeah. Well, I mean, it's just, I've been doing it all my life. Yeah. The thing that I, I did try to find, I mean, where the work came in was not actually just jotting down the terms or whatever, was actually finding written attestations of the terms. Because this is what the Oxford English Dictionary does. It doesn't record everything that sort of falls through somebody's mouth. Mm. You need an attestation, something right. in print. Yeah. And so I did scour, you know, Angling Club and blogs and websites and historical materials and dictionaries of all kinds just so I could get some sort of handle on when something was first attested. Did you not fall down just a multitude of rabbit holes, though? Why would I? <laughs> but, like, you know, when, you, you, when you're looking in, you know, when you're searching something, and let's say you have to go into an old club blog or something, and then you find something else, you go, oh, my God. I want to look at that as well. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I did. <laughs> I, I did. But, you know, you only have you only have one lifetime. Yeah, yeah. And Very some true. of this, yeah, I mean, the, some of the materials I was finding, I found immensely touching. For example, um, the, the River Castle Town, north of Dublin, it's very close to the Northern Irish border, Mm, it's loud, isn't it? Yeah, the, loud. the people who fished that river were immensely kind to me and took me under their wing, took me to the clubhouse, showed me some of the club archives and their records of care for the river, which went back right into the 19th century, early 20th century, together with photographs. And this rather unassuming, rather lovely river with its run of sea trout had been cared for by local people no, for 70, 80, 90 years, maybe longer. And there were photographs to prove it with trout in pails and rather earnest men self-consciously posing in top hats. 
you know, and these black and white photographs. And yeah, that was falling down a rabbit hole, but I was very glad to fall down that particular one. I was very touched. Yeah. It was this historical yeah. community of fly fishers and sea trout fishers sort of stretched back in time. Yeah. And, and, and you know, it was it was great to feel a part of all of that. Yeah, and, and, and as well, and I know from my own area here and throughout throughout the country, throughout any angling club or angling area, uh, all the anglers are very proud of what's gone before them. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I think, I hope we never lose that. I hope we never lose mm. that. I, it's something I found writ large everywhere in Ireland. But sometimes in England, I, I feel these days um, that we're in danger of, of losing that sensitivity to the power of what's gone before us. People are very, um, uh, I don't want to overstate this, but I'm slightly concerned by people wanting to catch fish and then put them immediately on WhatsApp or Facebook and illustrate their own prowess that way. Um, that's just kind of posing. That's having an angling experience, if you see what I mean. That's not fishing as I really understand it. And the fishing as I understand it and love it stretches back in time. It has that very important dimension, which is chastening and instructive and lovely. And it's fantastic. I think it's wonderful to, to be part of that community, which still stretches hundreds of years back from us. I couldn't agree more. Uh, and I, I love that. Couldn't agree more, Chris. Yeah. And it's part of my actually love of fly fishing is actually the culture and heritage around it. You know, and it's the reason why the podcast was started, the Ireland on the Fly, to kind of find out and talk about more about the fly fishing um, history and culture in Ireland. Um, and there's so much of it. It's so rich. And it's knowing you're part of that legacy. It's also for me as well, I think as well, and Tom as well, with the Irish language, what I yeah. love and, and and I hope we that's why I hope we you know the next generations they don't lose that is that interest in it like even just place names I'll always add, you know I'll be trying to figure out mm. what does that mean in Irish because yeah. that'll really tell you about the place you know and it's 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 that 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 link that that touch you know going back to the you know the centuries we we can never lose that because then we lose part of ourselves now I've tried in my own way and no doubt it's a clumsy way, an overwordy way and an imperfect way to write about all of this stuff. And I've tried to actually insist in some of the books that I've done that this these historical contexts are vital for us. Yep. You know, it's not just because I'm a historical linguist by training that I think that history is the high road really that leads leads us into the future. Yeah. Um, what we have been in so many ways, we are still, you know, we, we don't, proceed in life like a train passes through stations. You know, we, everything that we've been, as anglers, as thinkers, as writers, as human beings, we carry with us. So I think it's really important to, to retain the best of the old. You know, think of the care, for example, that was lavished on salmon and sea trout fisheries in the 19th century. And of course you can say, well, yeah, they, they sent river watches up as a kind of post-colonial, a colonial gesture um, to look after the, the rich man's salmon when they were spawning. But they did, you know, those river watches were up there in the river watches up in terrible conditions, but, you know, lavishing care on those those fish so they wouldn't get poached. Mm. certainly happened in, in parts of Scotland, and I believe it probably happened in parts of the west of Ireland as well. Yeah. And, of course, there's a horrible co colonial legacy in that, but the care for the river, the care for these runs of fish, the involvement the cultural involvement, the imaginative involvement is writ loud through centuries of angling literature. At the risk of sounding really sentimental, I'm going to quote you something from the Treaties of Fishing with an Angle. This is 15th century. And it's my favourite angling quote of all time. And I think everybody who fishes or ties fly should have this in their study above their desk. This is the quote, you shall not use this foresaid crafty discourse for any covetousness or for the increasing and sparing of your money only, but principally for your solace and to cause the health of your body and specially of your soul. And that was five, six hundred years ago. Yeah. There you yeah. go. Fantastic. That's, 
And that's mm-hmm. also, um, Chris, actually just speaking of that in terms of kind of the legacy and the tradition. And it's, it's, it's also the reason why it's so important nowadays in terms of, I think, with the environment. You know, the fly anglers were custodians yeah. of the rivers and the lakes. Mm. Yeah. And part of the reason now for me, for fishing, it's I just feel reconnected to nature because we're losing that so much in our daily lives that if I can get out once or twice a week, it's just my way of reconnecting with the environment around me. And that stretches back even further. That's part of who we are. One of the things that gives me um, an enormous kick these days is the work that occasionally we do on some of our streams in the Yorkshire Dales. So I had a, a, a good year last year on the River Wharf. I had a good season. I, I enjoyed it very greatly. And we were, we were all helped because we had quite a lot of extra water in the summer. But the fishing paled into insignificance when set alongside the day that we spent in March planting 200 older whips alongside the banks of one of our important spawning tributaries just to give the banks a bit of extra support and provide cover for the fish. And I remember that day as as keenly as I do any of the days that I spent fishing. And so I think, you know, reconnecting with nature is great, but it's even greater if it's not a posture and it involves a set of activities which are designed to yeah. enhance and develop the fishing. Chris, we could... <laughs> Because I I've more that I could ask you, but um, we'll um, we'll have to wrap it up now. And just before we do, I uh, can I just say, uh, I don't know if you want me to help you with etymology because it wasn't Wheeler's anthology; it was the Magic Wheel by David Perfume. Oh, Sorry. Wheel. Oh, I know that. Uh, yeah, of course. Yeah, but in my defence, there's a book here in front of me by Sarah Wheeler, Travels in a Long Country about Chile. Okay, so that you know, and you know, I was kind of mishmash in my head. So, but. That was the anthology I was on about. Uh, it's in that. But anyway, look, Chris, before we let you go, everybody we on the show, we asked them a question and we'd like to ask you, what's your most memorable fish on the fly? I knew this was this, I knew this question was coming and it's, it's absolutely impossible. I wish I could tell you that it was an Irish fish and I've, I've caught one or two memorable fish in Ireland, nothing particularly monstrous or, you know, shattering. But in fact, it was a, a brown trout of three pounds from the very headwaters of the River Wharf in Yorkshire. Um, St. George's Day, so April the 23rd, 1994, it took a little water hen blower uh, in a hatch of olives and the river was raging. I mean, it was a real spring flood and this fish, the outer limit of my expectations up in this beck, it's no more than a, an upland beck, was a pound. And so this three pounder, clearly it was a big fish that had run up there to spawn and was hanging around and starting its spring feeding. But it was uh, the most delightful fish. Yeah, it was a shock. And I've never caught a big yeah. one up there since for all for all the years of trying. But that you was must, really memorable. You must, got an, you must have got an awful shock when 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 this guy latched on. Yeah. Oh, it, I missed it first time round. It was so big. Yeah. It, you know, if I see something really big, my expectations are modest. So if I see something really big about to eat my fly, I'm going to miss it out of complete incompetence. I'll just raise the rod too quickly. And I'll curse myself for being an incompetent fool. But this fish was very obliging. And the next cast, it came again. And it looked like a salmon in that tiny river. It was magnificent. Yeah, it's not by no means my biggest fish, but it was certainly one of the most memorable. And um, and it's a it's a it's a river that I love. I still fish up there fairly regularly whenever the water levels allow. And it's amazing, isn't it? It all comes back, as you said, like between where you grew up and now you're back still oh, fish. You know, it's, it's remarkable. On on Friday this week, I shall be going back to where within fifty yards of where I caught my first ever fly caught trout on the River Rye near Helmsley in, in North Yorkshire. If ever you're over, uh, drop me a line and, and, and come and come and fish. I'd be delighted to give you a day as a guest. And likewise, Chris, you're going to have to fish Corrib. I'd love to fish the Corrib. That can be arranged. <laughs> Tom can bore you to death with all the different... 
Right. You remember how he said about being confined in a boat with somebody? <laughs> I can do yeah. that to you. <laughs> it's okay. But I, I give you fair warning. If you, I, I give, I give full measure. If we start talking about etymology, you know, you'll think, will this man ever shut up in the end of the boat? You know, try me. Strong men, <laughs> strong men have been known to fall asleep in the soup crying. <laughs> Well, look, for anyone interested, and I do highly recommend it, between Chris's book, his most recent one is River of All Goodbyes. Uh, there's also Names of the Fish in British and Irish Freshwaters, as uh, we spoke about earlier. And, of course, Nomads of the Tides, Fishing for Irish Sea Trout. Just three of probably about a dozen fishing books, Chris, I think you've written. And, unfortunately, according to you, it's going to be your last, but I don't believe you. I'm still expecting <laughs> a book or two. You might do, you might do um, one with Tom. <laughs> But after a day's fishing on carb, just record the conversation, and by the end of the day, you'll have a book done and dusted. I, I don't think I could live with him. <laughs> I don't think I could live with him. An Irish, a, an Irish scholar, a crack angler. I mean, you know, I'd be absolutely out of my league. <laughs> Chris McCulley, thanks again for joining us. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. It's been a, it's been a great pleasure. Our thanks to Chris for joining us on the show. And don't forget to rate, review and follow the Ireland on the Fly podcast on Apple, Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts from. Plus, you can keep up to date on IrelandOnTheFly.com as well as on Instagram. And myself and Tom will be back with another episode about the people and places of fly fishing in Ireland.